D-Day. Nylon tow ropes were carefully laid out, ready to take off of dozens of twin-toed gliders. Supplies of all kinds were loaded, including bulldozers and equipment for the use of the American engineers in constructing airstrips in the jungle. Burma, 1945, and the Allies launch an operation to open a jungle airstrip. The pilots and crews gathered to hear final instruction from Colonel Cochrane. Now, is there anything anybody doesn't know? There is, let's get it straight now. Men about to crash land, 200 miles behind enemy lines. Now, nothing you've ever done before in your life means a thing. Tonight, you're going to find out you've got a soul. Good luck. At dusk, the first planes took off, each transport towing twin gliders. When the sun rose over Broadway, it revealed a field littered with wounded gliders. There were wounded men, too, and some beyond wounds. It comes at quite a cost, but against the odds, the mission succeeds. By that afternoon, the engineers had completed their work. Broadway was open for business. And one of the first fighter pilots there, Kiwi Alan Peart in his Spitfire. This is his plane. With the arrival of RAF Spitfires and American P-51s on Broadway, air protection was made available to cover operations. But the enemy struck back. We are just having breakfast and we were lined up ready to take off when the radar station picked up these four bogies coming in fast, low and fast. Broadway was attacked by Zeros in a series of raids. He'd survived against incredible odds in North Africa and Europe. But Alan Peart was about to face his sternest test behind enemy lines. Suddenly under attack from the Japanese. I was just leaving the ground, undercarriage down, all the rest, when these four Japanese bogies that we were warned about flew right over the top of us and straight at the four Spitfires parked there and strafed them attack them. We tried to interfere but just had no flying speed or anything else. So we uh, did a sort of a semi split ass turn off the ground, climbed like hell and sort of pulled straight up onto our backs at about 2,000 feet, rolled out to find we were smack in the middle of another 20 odd Japanese fighters, which we'd know nothing about. They were the top cover, not picked up by the radar at all. And the first one was killed as our CO, Whittemore. Yes. I never heard from him again. I saw three enemy on his tail shooting at him. He shot one down. Uh, he was shooting at one while they were shooting at him. And I went to his assistance to discover I had three on my tail as well. So from there on, I was uh, busy getting rid of these. My main thing was to try to get free of them and uh, make myself a hard target. So there was some pretty mad flying. My tactics were to slip and skid, so, at, and of course, full engine power, climb up vertically, rolling, skidding and slipping, and then flip into a, a vertical dive. And this was only at around about two or 3,000 feet in a vertical dive and spin around with A-long turns, again, working the rudder so you were slipping and skidding and from side to side, and then pull out with a high G, and lose, and I, every time I lost those Japanese on my tail, every time I pulled out from that, but the fresh lot would latch on immediately. And so this went on for about 40 minutes.
one of them decided to do a head-on attack, so he got in front. It was a very quick snapshot. Uh, I just let loose and so on and, uh, and hit him. <laughs> he went straight in, apparently. The army uh, around saw it all happen. I was exhausted. I was so exhausted I couldn't move anymore. If you can imagine yourself in a boxing ring with no rounds, no stoppage or rounds, just boxing until you're exhausted, you exhaust yourselves very quickly. And this happened in my case. I could hardly move, and I thought, uh, if they're going to shoot me down, uh, I'd prefer to try to land and escape first. If I could plonk the aeroplane down and get into the jungle, they couldn't get at me, you see. Well, I'd just found a place and was going to turn around and have one last hack at them. Uh, suddenly, they left. They had a limit, too, to their endurance. My aeroplane was badly damaged. I'd stopped a, an explosive round somewhere. It had gone in behind the cockpit and exploded under the seat. The armour plate had uh, saved me, but the aeroplane engine mounting was broken. The uh, tail rivets sprung. I had six inches extra dihedral, and, and, and the plane was very badly damaged. Uh, however, still flyable. I was, of course, pumped up full of dre adrenaline. Adrenaline. I was really jumpy, and I remember I had to get out of the aeroplane, and I had to do a bit of sprinting around to sort of cool down. So uh, they refuelled it and so on, and I flew it back to uh, the Imphal Valley where we were based and reported the whole incident where I spoke to the air officer commanding at the time, and he immediately withdrew the whole thing. continued to defy the odds, survived the war, but went home with a view of the enemy, which has changed very little since. Well, you didn't think about it at the time. You, I just thought the bastards are not going to get me, so, and I just made it damn difficult for them. But the Germans, by and large, they observed the, the uh, Geneva Convention, uh, with odd departures, and the, the same applied, I think, to our side as well. So, and there's sort of mutual respect. In fact, I, I still have in my mind's eye a comp after a bit of a clash with one German squadron. I, I, I don't know whether it was imagination on my part, but I think we, we waggled our wings at each other as we parted. Uh, but, uh, so there was a sort of a mutual respect, but, in the case of the Japanese, they were a bestial lot. Uh, they behaved like beasts, and, and as far as we were concerned, they were going to be treated like beasts. I carried a, a stem gun and several magazines with me because I intended to uh, at least cause some damage before they killed me. <laughs> Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.